Good afternoon. Welcome to the European Reference Network Euroblot Net Topic on Focus on cutaneous lymphoma for patient organizations. This is a collaboration with the Lymphoma Coalition, the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation, France Lymphoma Espoir, and Euroordis. And the program aims to disseminate uh, the innovative topics related to cutaneous lymphoma among patient organizations in order to improve capacity building and to give visibility to the medical services available in Europe. Today's session is about treatment options available in Europe, and we will be focused on skin directed therapy and systemic therapy and clinical trials. We have uh, very uh, relevant voices today with us. Uh, Professor Rudolf Stadler will be presenting the clinical part, and Guy Bouquet will be in charge of the patient voice. Professor Rudolf Stadler uh, chairs the Department of Dermatology of the De Medical Center Minden. Uh, this is a leading dermatology department in Europe and is one of the largest in Germany. Um, he has been president of the German Society of Dermatology and the Cutaneous Lymphoma Task Force of the European Organization for Research and Treatment of Cancer. Uh, he has a vast research activity and has received several awards in recognition of his outstanding and exemplary contribution to promoting and advancing dermatology at national and international level. Uh, as I mentioned, the patient representation will be uh, on charge of Guy Bouquet. Guy is patient expert, president and co-founder of France Lymphoma Espoir. And he's involved on an international level as a director of the Lymphoma Coalition Europe. He's also a member of the European uh, Society for Bone Marrow Transplantation Patient Advisory Committee and participates in several advisory boards and it's involved in building different education programs. We also have today with us Susan Thornton. She was a promoter of this program. She's the CEO of Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation and has a personal experience with cutaneous um, lymphoma. And I want also to say thank you to Ariane Weinman, the Eurordis Public Affairs Senior Manager. She supports the European patient groups advocating the four European reference networks, including Euroblotnet. So without losing more time in this, I will give the floor to Professor Rudolf to start his presentation. Welcome, everybody. Yeah, welcome uh, everybody to you, everybody. Uh, thanks for this uh, exceptional introduction. It's an honor to me to talk to you, to the uh, patient foundation. And uh, so it's uh, important to have a close connection between patients and physicians to increase our knowledge and, for, for, and most important, to get uh, the future perspectives in cutaneous lymphoma so that we can finally cure patients of cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. And I have to thank Euroblattnet that which, uh, this is now our topic today. So cutaneous lymphoma, new therapeutic developments is my uh, uh, presentation. And this is my conflict of interest It's all companies who are involved in clinical research and uh, studies of uh, CTCL. So the agenda is, is uh, basic therapeutic concepts, new therapeutics, and how are the future directions. Uh, the agenda and the learning objectives today is the uh, therapeutic concepts, new therapeutics, future directions. And what are the uh, key uh, concepts? Uh, first of all, early stage mycosis fungoides should be treated with skin-directed therapy. And mycosis fungoides starts with limited disease in general, uh, with some exceptions. So uh, the basic uh, motion is to keep cutaneous T-cell lymphoma in an early stage of the disease. There are also periods where you can have expectant therapy when no treatment is uh, preferred. In advanced uh, stage mycosis fungoides or sensory syndrome, systemic treatments may be considered as first-line therapy. 
And of course, there are also uh, patients in middle age with advanced stage disease. And this is uh, the most problematic uh, patient group. They, uh, then we have to discuss uh, is a, a reduced allogeneic hematoretic stem cell transplantation to maybe cure these patients. But of course, this is a, a hard decision because a number of patients will die by this kind of treatment approach. And finally, a holistic approach to patient care with consideration of health-related quality of life is essential and symptomatic relief of pain, itch, insomnia, and depression may be needed. And by our international proclipi study, we will also address these uh, questions. What we know from the past is some basic principles to avoid cytotoxic therapies as long as possible. It has been shown that highly aggressive therapy or multi chemotherapy will not prolong the life of the affected patients. And give skin care with emollients, reducing bacterial colonization, most important. I will come later on that. Treat additional uh, symptoms, pruritus, especially in patients with Cesare syndrome. Use standard treatments correctly, PUVA, protochemotherapy, and systemic therapies, and think about maintenance therapy, one important issue. And what is uh, for me and my experience over all these years, keep in close contact with your, with your physician, because if something pops up, then immediately get in contact with them to, uh, uh, to clear the skin. That's uh, my uh, notion to that. Uh, the treatment strategy still uh, uh, in this uh, decade is stage dependent on the stage of the disease. So from uh, mycosis fungoides stage one to uh, sensory syndrome or to, uh, or including uh, um, uh, uh, viscera involvement it's all stage adapted. And we, we start with uh, uh, skin directed therapies all over, over decades with uh, potent topical steroids, with narrow band UVB, photochemotherapy. And what is new, at least uh, uh, in Europe and especially in Germany, is to use the alkaline chlorometine gel. The others, uh, the, especially Bexarotin gel, made it never to Europe. It's still available in US and Canada. And all these uh, approaches is, has the idea to avoid progression of the disease. And uh, if we talk about skin-directed treatment responsible in topical therapies, then you can see on the right the response rates in all these controlled studies. These were controlled randomized studies with a huge number of patients in early disease stage. And as you can see, the solution compared to the gel was not inferior. And so uh, this compound was approved worldwide, not only in the US, also in Europe for the treatment, specific treatment with alkylance of early stage disease and as combination part in patients with advanced disease, which have not only tumors, uh, which have in addition patches or plaques. So both together uh, means a tremendous advantage in this kind of therapy for uh, these uh, patients. And we ourselves have uh, done a, a cohort study in patients in two German skin lymphoma centers with Ulrike Wekam and myself to show that uh, also in daily practice, uh, it, it, it's uh, chromatin gel, Lidaga uh, is of great help in the treatment of uh, CTCL uh, patients. And what are the current systemic treatments in advanced uh, mycosis fungoides on Cesare syndrome? We have the immunomodulators, the non-toxic compounds, which are the rexinoids. This is an example is the bexarotene, uh, uh, with the trade tra name uh, tagretin, 
the retinoids, the acitretin, and the interferon. The interferon is now uh, stopped and uh, uh, withdrawn from the uh, international market. Uh, uh, several uh, companies uh, did that, including Roche. So we have now worldwide the pegulated form of interferon available, and we can use it in a microgram dose once per week to replace the former interferon widely used uh, worldwide in the treatment of cutaneous T cell lymphoma. And in addition, we have uh, extracorporeal photovoresis, which uh, has shown to be uh, potent over more than 30 years with no uh, major side effects, very a, a good handling, and uh, which can be used as basic therapy and in, uh, in patients with uh, erythrodermic MF, and of course also in combination with the immunomodulators. In recent years, uh, radiotherapy advanced a lot. It could be shown that low dose radiotherapy is enough to control the disease especially with total skin electron beam therapy. One has not only one single shot, one can do it twice or uh, in special cases twice. And then we are coming to the antibody-based therapeutics, which I will discuss in detail. And the HDAC inhibitors, which we are uh, looking as maintenance uh, therapeutic uh, worldwide. And of course, single agent chemotherapy, which uh, one of the most used compounds is, is again cytobine, then the polychemo and the allogeneic stem cell transplantation. What, what is very important is the holistic approach. And I told you that uh, bacteria can drive the disease. Exotoxins of Staphylococcus aureus will uh, stimulate uh, interleukin-2 production and thereby increasing T cells and modulate the, uh, the cytokine profile to an immunosuppressive status so that even more interleukin-10, which is immunosuppressive acting, uh, uh, tends uh, uh, to even more uh, uh, shift the patient into immunosuppressive. And Lindahl and co-workers have nicely shown that by a cocktail, using a cocktail, cutaneous uh, T-cell lymphoma can be controlled and resolved and then continue with other kinds of therapies. Coming to the antibody-based therapies, this has uh, very much advanced our field by addressing uh, certain uh, epitopes on uh, uh, T cells like CD30, CD52, uh, which is uh, expressed almost on all blood cells. The uh, chemokine receptor uh, T cell uh, is uh, expressed on skin homing T cells. And uh, KIA DL2, the KIA antibody, uh, and uh, is expressed on, uh, belongs to a immunoglobulin like family and is uh, expressed of NK cells and transformed MF cells and especially in cessary cells. So these are markers uh, which are important to be addressed and also T cell activation markers like uh, PDL1. The others I won't discuss uh, uh, in this uh, presentation. So what is now approved uh, worldwide is uh, 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 three compounds. This is uh, brentuximab, velotin, mogamulizumab, and for short line therapy, alemtuzumab. Brentuximab uh, uh, was uh, uh, proven in a huge uh, study, phase three study worldwide performed, the so-called Alcanza study comparison of brentuximab to a physician's uh, choice. And it uh, could be shown over, uh, over now three years that uh, uh, almost 55% uh, reached the uh, primary uh, intention of treat population, the overall response rate lasting more than four months. 
And this was highly significant against physician choice. But what was the most important is that the progression-free survival uh, lasted almost 17 months, which we have never seen with any other kind of treatment uh, in the past. And here you see this uh, uh, survival, not the survival curve, the probability of PFS and the uh, red line, the ones uh, which were centered uh, and uh, belonged to the Brentuximab Vedotin uh, treatment uh, group. And for example, uh, this is a patient uh, uh, which we treated very early uh, where the drug was not approved, only approved for second line therapy in Hodgkin's disease. Then we used uh, Brentuximab Vedotin. These red bars are the side columns, are the cycles. And here you can see the uh, tremendous involvement here of the leg. Uh, of this patient with CTCL, and this uh, uh, drug is given every uh, three weeks, and then we increase the cycles, and he's now uh, still a couple of years later free of uh, disease. And besides that, besides clinical studies, there is a real world, and uh, my dear colleague Julia Skerisbrick, head of the Birmingham Lymphoma Center, she uh, uh, did a case uh, study uh, on CD30 positive cutaneous T cell lymphoma. And they, she could show and prove, uh, prove that uh, all these patients showed major, either complete responses or uh, uh, partial response or at least stable disease. And in some depending on uh, the uh, grade of CD30 uh, uh, expression. And what we know today from uh, extensive further research is also patients with large cell transplant formation will benefit from this uh, uh, drug, even patients with low numbers of CD30 positivity. And uh, to increase the PFS, one can combine this drug with skin-directed therapies uh, where we, what we did we uh, either lowered the dose of brentuximab to 1.2 milligram every three weeks. And when we sh sh saw progressive disease, then we added, added uh, skin-directed therapies and we could increase partial remission and stable disease without increasing uh, toxicity. The other important, uh, important uh, uh, antibody is uh, Mogamulizumab, a humanized anti-CCL antibody with a defecalizated FC region. This, as you know, CCF4, as I told you, is expressed on homing uh, T cells and uh, in also in circulating T cells and on uh, so-called uh, uh, tracks, uh, the regulatory uh, T cells. And Mogamulizumab induces towards the malignant C-cell antibody dependent cytotoxic cytotoxicity, so to destroy, uh, and uh, it's also a double hit uh, by uh, uh, addressing these regulatory uh, T-cells. And uh, this big study, it's, it was a huge study with uh, 186 uh, patients, uh, the so-called Maverick study, and you see that especially patients benefit from it with Cesare syndrome, with a leukemic, with the leukemic variant of uh, MF. And also this patient cohort showed a, a highly uh, a long standing duration, which, uh, which lasts for Cesare syndrome patients over 17 uh, months. The so drug is applied by EVU, uh, effusions uh, weekly in the first months and then. Uh, twice uh, months uh, in, uh, on day one and 15, following a 28 day uh, cycle. And here to here, the PFS uh, compared to the uh, Vorinostat shows uh, the uh, priority of this compound gegenüber HDAC uh, inhibitors. And here, for example, accessory patients. With, uh, which is uh, under uh, therapy with uh, mogamulizumab, 
And what is, besides that he's uh, off erythroderma, he, what is mostly uh, bothering these patients is the uh, enormous pruritus. And this is uh, gone uh, after two, three cycles. They don't have any symptoms anymore, which reduce their life quality a lot. And another effect is of mogalizumab because the tracks are addressed, the tumor, uh, the uh, T cell regulatory cells, that autoimmunity can be induced. And this autoimmunity is somehow uh, beneficial for the patients. So the, they, these induce cytotoxic T cells and uh, which uh, uh, kill the malignant ones. And so there were two patients which are free of disease and which is, was reported by Martin Bagos uh, 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 from Paris. Uh, and uh, so these are exceptional results. And uh, one other big point is how can we uh, uh, maintain the achievements with this modern kind of therapies that led us to maintenance therapy in patients with mycosis fungoides or sedentary syndrome. So this is a really neglected topic. No one, nobody focused in recent years on that. Uh, can I do maintenance therapy by uh, by radi uh, by PUVA therapy or narrow band UVB or bexalotene or whatever? And we started. Uh, um, uh, a study with resminostat, which is an HDAC inhibitor, and uh, in introducing a worldwide uh, in a controlled study. And this concept of maintenance therapy is according also to the stage that you get these patients in 2B, from 2B back. Of course, you can't recalculate them into stage B, but Clinically, they don't have any tumors anymore. And then the question is how to maintain the non tumoral stage. And then we can be, and then the patient has to be treated and not only be observed. And that is the key question we kind to address in, uh, in, uh, with this study. And this study uh, uh, is a, a phase two study with 190 patients worldwide. In, uh, more than 50 centers uh, with, uh, and treated with uh, this HDAC inhibitor orally over uh, day one to, to five, and then in a, a two weeks uh, a cycle. So we hope that we can prevent, uh, present you. We have all, uh, almost finished the study. We have 180 patients now, and we are still 10 missing. So we hope that we can get these two, eight, 10 patients randomized in this trial and then give you the data next year. So what are the new therapeutic developments done by the EOATC CLTF uh, group? And uh, this is our agenda, uh, studies which are uh, uh, already closed or which and others which are uh, upcoming in this year. So the one which is completed was the so-called PARC study, the phase two trial of artisomizumab in the treatment of stage 2B mycosis fungoides and cesarean syndrome in relapsed refractory stage of the disease after at least one previous systemic therapy. And the primary objective was to determine the anti tumor activity of artisomizumab uh, in these patients' cohort. And uh, this assessed in terms of the overall. Uh, response rate. And this study is also combined with translational research. These results of this study will be presented by myself at the October meeting of the EOTC CLTF in Marseille, organized by Professor Bago from uh, Paris. And the upcoming one is one study uh, which is called uh, REACH. Uh, you can follow these studies by clinicaltrials.gov. You can uh, read the whole text and in more detail than I can present it to you in this uh, lecture. Uh, the aim is to study and determine the etiology of chromatin gel induced skin drug reaction in early stage mycosis fungoides for cutaneous T cell lymphoma and to determine the primary objective, the activity of the drug as measured by response rate in patients 
treated with this uh, chromatin gel without kin drug reaction, we will have three groups and which will have no reaction who uh, ones who have reaction when we will uh, lower the application rate and the third group who have severe reaction then we will uh, skin testing and uh, go in more detail what is the reason uh, for this uh, skin irritation or allergic uh, uh, contact dermatitis and besides that we do translational research and the other trial is uh, the so-called uh, 1820 MOGAT trial, also sponsored by the EORTC. It's an open label phase two multicenter study of this anti-CCF4 monoclonal antibody plus total skin electron beam therapy in patients with stage 1B, 2B cutaneous T cell lymphoma and uh, uh, to evaluate the progression-free survival rate at uh, 48 weeks. Uh, uh, in combination with this CCF4 monoclonal antibody and uh, TSEB. And also this study is combined with uh, translational uh, research. How are the future directions? In the last uh, 10 years, a number of uh, uh, important papers came out to show where our mutational load uh, is located in which signaling pathways. The information from the outside to the cell uh, goes through a number of molecules which can be mutated. And uh, so far, we did not succeed in finding one major mutation. Like in melanoma, we can address BRAF in 40 to 50 percent of the patients. This is not the case in cutaneous T cell lymphoma. It's much more hard work. And then to uh, look for any mutation in these patients, and then to ask the question, do we have uh, molecules within which we are able to, uh, uh, to uh, stop this signaling pathway, which uh, the, benefit, the patient could be uh, benefit, of benefit. And one uh, uh, study closed with the Dimethyl fumarate in uh, Cesare syndrome and MF, which uh, 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 inhibits uh, the NF kappa B pathway. So we will see what is coming out on this phase two study. And the other ones, the antibody molecules, I discussed uh, with you. And the ones which is now in the phase two study is an important one, is in a development out of Europe, out of France. This EPH4102 uh, is now called Lakutamab is the first in class anti kir dl 2 monoclonal antibody and has been shown in this phase one trial to have an excellent uh, response rate in this early phase one uh, uh, trial and uh, an excellent side effect profile. And now this study uh, is uh, brought uh, into a phase two one, which is performed in Europe and also in the US. And I think next year, end of next year, we will have some more data about the potential role of this Lakuta map, this Kia DL2 monoclonal antibody. And the other one is the ones uh, with uh, PD, uh, addressing the PD1, PDL2, X, TL1 axis. And what we have seen is yin yang in so form that we have patients who benefit excellently and others who progress. Uh, tremendously. But uh, in the moment, uh, we have not uh, the right idea and the right molecule identified. There might be one uh, which gives us uh, a hint which patient uh, would benefit from PD1 or PDL1 uh, uh, therapy. But this we will answer, I think, in uh, sure in the next uh, couple of years. So what is uh, summarizing what I told you is and what are the take home message is that uh, still today stage adapted therapy is of most utmost important and this in close contact with the patient. There is no uh, gold standard, but there is a number of ways to do it wrong. So this uh, should be uh, uh, known uh, and is uh, a major strategy. 
Second, these antibodies I showed you, these antibody-based therapies improved CTCL therapy in recent years. And with this, we can, in, in combining these new compounds, we may advance the field uh, uh, and uh, patients will benefit from that. And then on the th third point, maintenance therapy as an important concept to keep the patient at least with minor involvement of the skin or totally clear. But uh, since we do not have any cure, so maintenance therapy is of utmost importance. And then I showed you, uh, told you that uh, the uh, antibiotic therapy and the bacterial exotoxins drive the malignant process. So there must be a holistic approach to patient care. Besides antibiotic therapy, uh, decrease the colonization of bacteria on the skin. And besides that, uh, uh, treat pruritus and uh, pain and everything what bothers these uh, terrible, terrified patients. And of course, we have to work hard to uh, design new clinical studies and do uh, basic uh, translational research to improve the field in the near future. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Stadler. And I think that is such a wonderful presentation to show everyone what's been happening really relatively recently in new therapies for cutaneous lymphoma patients, all of the research that's been going on behind the scenes to understand the complexity of this disease. There's no one easy answer. And I think the, um, the terminology is, if you've seen one patient, you've seen one patient. And we've got a lot of work to do to figure out how to create these newer therapies to target the right patient at the right time wherever they may be in their um, disease journey, right? So, but I think from a patient perspective, it's so exciting to know that all this work is being done and so much more to learn, but we've really made some great progress in the last um, five to 10 years that has been unprecedented. So, and more, more to come, more to come, which is really exciting. So yeah. thank you very much. And I think that sets up our next, next guest speaker, um, my wonderful colleague and dear friend, uh, Guy Bouguet, who uh, comes to us from France and the French Lymphoma Organization. And really, um, Guy, the, the importance of patient advocacy and why, as those of us that are patients and are kind of immersed in making the connections with the clinical community and the regulatory community and how that's so important, the role that this patient advocacy plays um, to bring these new therapies to the table, but also to feed back what the real patient experience is. So I will turn it over to you to share a little bit about um, your experience and, and what you've been doing in the arena of patient advocacy, um, not only in France, but really globally and throughout Europe. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> um, I, I also wanted to start by this uh, comment as uh, Professor Stadler was uh, speaking. I realized how uh, tremendous the advances in treating uh, cutaneous lymphoma was, were made in the last five to 10 years. I mean, as far as quality of life with, you know, the appearance of this gel, the gel that is now you know, helping people to have a better uh, quality of life, but all those new molecules, those antibodies, and, and we see that there is, there is new one coming up. So it is just really, it is just amazing what's happening. But I know it is an area where um, there was a lot of unmet needs. And it is important that, you know, the industry and the researcher focus on uh, on this uh, on this side of uh, science, uh, regarding yeah, you, you you mentioned that I have I have some type of, a, of of an history with with the disease. Well, I don't have specifically an history with uh, uh, cutaneous lymphoma. I was diagnosed with follicular lymphoma, which is a 
a more systemic type of lymphoma, one of the most common uh, type of uh, indolent lymphoma. But what I can share with some of the uh, cutaneous patients is, is, uh, is two things. The, the one thing is the fact that the indolent form of lymphoma I had was a, a, a recurring type of lymphoma. It's a lymphoma type that basically relapse every so often. For some people, it does not relapse, you know, for a very long time. For me, I felt like, yeah, it, it is very similar to what some of uh, cutaneous lymphoma patient can experience, which is a, a relapsing uh, period that is very short and basically having to increase into the treatments uh, uh, potential and treatments uh, um, uh, availability. And at the end, um, what actually I can share as well with some of the patient is the fact that um, I had to go through a allogenic bone marrow transplant and going through that process, you know, as you know, Professor Stadler say, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very, um, I would say, um, um, very specific steps in, in, into the treatment of uh, a lymphoma. We know it does work, and, but sometimes it, it doesn't work, and we don't know why it doesn't work. But when it works, it is, um, it, it, it is, um, uh, it's miraculous when it does work, when basically the bone marrow transplant you know, the, the marrow or the immune system you receive from your donor actually managed to keep the disease um, uh, in control. And that's, that's amazing. But, you know, like every other treatments, they could be uh, topic treatments, they could be intravenous treatment, uh, they could be antibodies or CAR T cell. There are always side effects. And for, for bone marrow transplant, uh, allogenic transplant, there are some. There could be some serious side effect. It is not a a rejection of the uh, of the graft, but it is basically developing some uh, autoimmune diseases, um, which basically basically put me or put the patient into a different type of uh, a medicine. Like um, I've been grafted um, 16 years ago, but I don't see my hematologist anymore. You know, for the last 16 years, I've see, I'm seeing a a, a a graft a transplant doctor which is a completely different science. And this, the science of the graft doctor is to basically make sure that, you know, those immune system, they can co-abide, uh, co-live together. Anyway, so um, so th this, is, this is what I can share with uh, some of the uh, cutaneous patients as far as my experience. But as far as the work that I'm doing every day, um, after I was diagnosed uh, for follicular lymphoma, I realized that there was not enough information. You know, the, it's basically the usual process of uh, understanding what's around for patients, uh, how our patients can make a a, uh, um, a wise decision on their treatment. I can understand the treatment. So I, re I realized um, that was in 2000. There was no information. So I co-founded uh, an organization called France L'Informe Espoir in 2006. As a matter of fact, the day I created this structure, I went to the meeting room inside the hospital with my, um, I don't know how you call it in English, basically I was still connected with, to my IV. I had just received my, uh, my uh, bone marrow transplant uh, a couple of weeks uh, before that. So the idea behind, behind the patient organization is, is basically, um, uh, it's, it's to provide, okay, provide information, educate patients so that we are, we do have patients that, as I say, understand what's what's happening to them, and they can make the proper decision, have the the proper discussion, and and evaluate the treatment with their with their uh, uh, with their doctors. So the mission is information. It's also providing support support to the patients that go through the uh, go through the disease by different type of means. Uh, it could be meetings, it could be platforms, it could be any anything like this. Uh, and it's also the care that we uh, uh, we provide those uh, uh, those disinformation and the support for, and of course at one point it is to support research and in the way we can try to uh, stimulate uh, part of, stimulate the research, and of course uh, and that came with time for us because uh, you know when you start you're very small you depend on uh, on some uh, um, sponsors and then as you stay alive as an, as an organization, you do creative work, you, you become more, um, let's say, an actor into the, uh, into the system and, 
and um, you are a validated actor. We engaged into advocacy, and this is this is where um, well Susan and I and Natasha we've been doing quite some work together uh, at the international level, but also at the national level. It is basically being able to represent the patient in front of the authorities and the regulators. It is um, telling them that you know they're making the wrong choice, they're making the wrong decision and really fight for the um, fight for the patients. Um, I'm very lucky also, uh, I didn't mention that, but my organization is located in the same hospital as Martin Bagot and Professor Stadler mentioned her quite uh, quite a bit and Professor Bagot is is at the source of many research that were uh, highlighted earlier uh, today. And so I have the chance to, uh, to, to talk to her and get some insight from her. And over the last, uh, I say 18 months, we've been doing quite some work on this um, mogaluzumab um, uh, treatment because uh, it, was, uh, it was gonna be first approved in Europe through the French, through, uh, France was gonna be the first country to approve the disease and actually uh, uh, negotiate, the price for, uh, negotiate the price for the molecule. And over the, over the last 18 months, we, we had to struggle quite a bit. And recently we managed to, um, to basically allow this treatment to be uh, prescribed, uh, to be um, uh, infused at home, which is, a, which is a very big improvement, especially during the pandemic uh, uh, area, the uh, pandemic time. We were able to fight for reimbursement and making sure that the uh, molecule was completely reimbursed wherever the patient was uh, uh, was treated treated in France, so that access to everyone was a major uh, uh, a major work. So again, yes, we're doing a lot of work with uh, Martin Bagot, and Martin Bagot is she's never let's say um, in um, uh, 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 in need of uh, well, she always had good ideas into into developing new therapies and new trials. Um, as I said earlier, um, we do work, um, Natasha, uh, Susan, and Susan and I, through different type of networks, through uh, also uh, the ER, ERN network, we do collaborative work together. Um, we are part of different uh, groups, like international uh, collaborative organization, like the Lymphoma Coalition. Uh, we do participate into the EBMT, EHA. We try to... Um, um, well, we try to influence also the the decision makers, but the people who actually uh, 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 do the treatments of and provide the uh, provide treatments. But we also share our own experience. And uh, for instance, with uh, the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation, um, I've been yeah, working with Susan for many years. And the first step of our collaboration was to basically do uh, um, uh, um, create a, 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 a brochure for the French patients, and we used the model of the uh, uh, coalition for the uh, Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation. We used that as a baseline for for the development of our brochure, and we of course adapted it to uh, um, uh, to the French uh, to the French system. And it was, I mean, it was key to have someone like uh, 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 like Susan because you know over the years uh, um, over the years we had also as a patient organization neglected those rare lymphomas and and. If it hadn't been for uh, for Susan, I don't think we would have done it as fast as we uh, uh, we've, we, we've done it. And it is uh, today. I must say that the the brochure, the document that we created, is extremely uh, uh, well uh, perceived and and used by patients and uh, and uh, doctors. And I, I think you bring up a really good point, Guy, when you, especially for the rare the rarer diseases, how important it is for all of us on the patient advocacy side to work together and collaborate because none of us can do the work on our own. Um, we, for us in the cutaneous lymphoma foundation world, understand the disease very well. We understand the patient experience and we are very fortunate to be invited to the scientific meetings to learn about what's happening in research and clinical trials and connecting. But, you know, we're small, there's only five of us. So trying to be expert in what's happening in France or what's happening in Spain or other locations is really hard. And of course we don't speak the language so that makes it even more difficult. 
So these collaborations uh, are so, so critical to bringing the information to the patients and really bridging that kind of that gap between, you know, what happens in the clinic with the patients and then what happens when they go home and then they have all these questions and how do they manage that? And then bringing that information back again into the whole process. Um, and I think with all of the new therapies that are becoming available, the challenge now is how do we make sure that while they may be approved on the clinical side, that they actually are available for patients under the different health systems and the access and the reimbursement. And that really requires a lot of collaborative effort and data collection, which is where the independent patient perspective come in, comes into play. And we have to all work together to be able to present that kind of um, united front, right? Um, to make sure that at the end of the day, all the patients have access to not only the therapies, but the specialty physicians and how do they know who they are and where do they get them? So it's, um, we all have to work together. And I think that's what makes this all fabulous and very exciting to be able to get to this point. And it's been a great, I think uh, our, our collaboration over the many years as we've kind of done it not really super formally, but has made a big impact. And now we have this great opportunity um, to co-host with uh, Martine Bago, kind of our first formal patient program after the finish of the scientific meeting in Marseille. So that will be so exciting. And I think yeah. that's a culmination of many years. Of Absolutely. I, I, had, uh, I had noted that we need, it's on, it's on October 16th for people who are interested. It will be in Marseille. It will be the first patient uh, session at EORTC. Yes, and all delivered in French, except yeah. for me. <laughs> and, and in English, if we have, if we have enough right. uh, English speakers, we'll have the translation. Yeah, um, that's great. I, I just, I just want to quickly finish what I was, uh, I was gonna, was gonna do, um, talk about. I mean, you know, patient support here. Here, you, you have like the the brochure that we've done, but I want to cover some of the challenges uh, because we, we we've done a survey. Um, to identify what were you know, specific challenges for those rare types of lymphoma. And we measured uh, uh, Hodgkin lymphoma for uh, young, young adults, and we measured as well cutaneous lymphoma. And um, uh, it, it is, it is a, a really a disease of, of its own, uh, of course, and, and they are uh, also added to the fact that there are so many different subtypes of cutaneous lymphoma that don't get the same type of uh, uh, treatments. Um, but, but the most challenging part is knowledge of the disease. It's the knowledge of the disease from the patients and still uh, uh, and, and some, some of the medical, uh, um, um, medical um, professionals, some of them. The diagnosis process can take, you know, it does take a long time for, uh, um, re for other bigger type of lymphoma. It can take, it can take months sometimes, but, but for uh, cutaneous lymphoma, it could be extremely long and it is extremely frustrating. It, it can take years. Is cutaneous lymphoma treated by hematologist or by dermatologist? That sometimes is a real problem because the patient get bounced back from one, one specialist to another. And sometimes, yes, some, some, some expert center are very lucky to have, to have put a, a system in place to, to care for this, but in other places it's difficult. Is there a cure, really? Is there a real cure for, for some type of uh, cutaneous lymphoma? That's a question. Treatment uh, options and, and, and burden of the disease. Um, of course, you know, the burden of the disease, it is one of the type of lymphoma that is actually visible and it could be, it could be a real challenge in, in, a society, in society that uh, um, when, when, you when you show your, your, your differences. And the last thing is clinical trials. And clinical trials is very important, and we see that the activity is growing, is growing as well. And just to just an example is we put together a, a website in France, a platform where you know the uh, French patient can go and look and find out if there is a, a a clinical trial in France that is open phase two or phase three that addresses uh, their subtype of uh, of lymphoma, and we give them all the information in a comprehensive language, of course, in French, 
um, for those who speak French, and also we refer them to the hospital where those trials are open. So this is part of uh, informing and giving the giving the tools to the to the patients so that you know they can take care of themselves as well in a in a very um, uh, difficult uh, uh, journey sometimes. Great. I Thank don't you. know if you want to take the questions now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before you, may I just interrupt? Please, go, go. And yes. uh, 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 Susan and, and uh, Guy, if I, if I can tell, uh, address you like this, I would thank you for, for this tremendous engagement. I think this is uh, not only important for the physicians, uh, for the patients, and also for the physicians, because uh, you know, uh, dealing with cutaneous T cell lymphoma, and I, I see a dear friend of mine, which is also following, is Robert Knobler. He's a pioneer of, uh, of photophoresis uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in Europe and also all over the world. Uh, so th this you have you have to have passion for these uh, patients. And uh, you, you, you asked the question: hematology or dermatology? It, it's not an uh, it's not a question either uh, hematology or dermatology. Uh, I think uh, we have to have corporations and uh, the hematologists have different ideas than we uh, from the dermatology part. Uh, and you see they, the hematologists were much more aggressive by history than we did. And so the combination might be a benefit lastly for the patient. And what you achieved in, in France, we have to put that, as you mentioned, all over Europe. And uh, to, to get in touch, maybe we, we can address uh, the representatives of each country in, uh, in Marseille under the guidance of you uh, uh, and of uh, Martin, a dear friend, which uh, does, as you said, exceptional work on CTCL. And uh, as you see, uh, the uh, Hospital Saint Louis has a Z tradition of cutaneous lymphoma worldwide. So we hope we can come together and also our national health systems has to come together because it can't be that, uh, that a patient in France can, it, can get Mogamulizumab at home and in other countries uh, only in the hospital or even if he can get it mm. so this yeah. we have to overcome so but this is a, a is, is a nice uh, is, uh, achievement what you did for your patients in your country and i think uh, this is exceptional thank you so much totally agree and i think what's so exciting is that we're we're on the edge now with the visibility of the disease and being able to do a program like this to bring people together in visibility and um, it's it's a new a new future for all of us, which is really fabulous. It's really fabulous. So thank you. Okay, we had a couple of questions. Um, there was a question earlier in your presentation, Professor Sadler, about what does it mean when you talk about clinical trials and physicians' choice, you know, within the clinical trial arm. Oh, you're on mute. Unmute. Excuse me. Professor, there the, you go. <laughs> the, the physician's choice is either a standard kind of therapy, what we did in the past, also like mesotrexate was a comparator in, uh, uh, in the brentuximab uh, 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 study, or an HDEC uh, uh, inhibitor, which was uh, uh, approved in the United States, not in Europe. So these are the comparators as physician's choice. Right. So it gets complicated, especially in a rare disease when not all the treatments that may have may be available are actually available in the country that is conducting the clinical trial. So it gets it gets even more challenging. That's but right. yes, which hopefully will be in the future, that won't be the case. But but you know, uh, in, in spite of the fact uh, we are living uh, either in the US or in Europe or elsewhere, uh, our dear colleague uh, Pietro Quaglino is uh, mm -hmm. the head of the lymphoma unit in, in Italy. Uh, uh, he has shown over through the Proclippi study 
that uh, patients, uh, whatever we do in the United States or in Europe, have the same prognostic index. Uh, so we, we don't have any secret bullets in either continent, neither in US nor in Australia. So we, we are basically doing what I, I showed you. But the, but the skill is to combine it correctly and, and, and use it uh, uh, timely. That's, that's, a, that's a, a secret uh, uh, in handling lymphoma patients. Right, right. And, and again, why it's so important for patients to understand some of these components of, so that they can participate because without the patients participating, you can't gather the data and, and we need to feed back, well, what's our, what, what is our experience? How did this work? Was this available? Would a home infusion be a good option? Would that be, you know, so you got, yeah. you've got to collect all of that information and put it together for the best possible way to treat and share it amongst all the clinicians worldwide. Um, anyway, I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> um, someone asked, is there a foundation in Belgium? Not yet, but there is one in the Netherlands, which is right next door. And our friends, Mickey and Ton are here on, on, um, on the webinar. And, you know, one of our, our goals is to connect with patients in the different countries. If there isn't an organization, because it's such a small, rare disease, it takes a lot of effort, like Guy shared, to not only create a foundation, and I think Mickey and Ton can probably speak to this um, because they've just done this recently, but then to maintain it over a long period of time and to be able to deliver the information and to have the technology to do it requires a lot of effort and, um, and some money, actually. So, you know, the goal is really to connect everybody and to leverage our colleagues from other bigger lymphoma groups like these and plug in the cutaneous components kind of underneath within the country. So, um, you know, we're, we're starting, but we're happy to help you in any way and connect you into the larger cutaneous lymphoma community. So feel free to reach out to myself or to Guy or to Nikki and Tom. Um, and I'll, I'll put my, um, my email here in the, in the chat so that you can reach out and happy to, ooh, um, happy to help. Because I think the, the important thing is to connect the patients together, however we may do that through all different methodologies. Um, let's see, and I know we had a question with regards to the impact of stress on the disease. So, I don't know, Professor Stadler, that this question gets answered, asked quite a lot. Um, is, and I think we have a lot of anecdotal information, but no one's really looking at the scientific data to oh, see yeah. if there's any this impact. Is a, this is a part of a future project uh, of the pro Clippy study of quality of life to better that so we, we don't have really, uh, really correct data. But uh, anyhow, in, 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 uh, in general speaking, stress in every situation of cancer is not a good idea, not a good advice. Uh, and uh, so the, any physician should uh, try uh, to uh, get the burden of the disease from the patient and give him hope uh, and uh, um, uh, give him a clear recommendations. And uh, this is my... I think uh, most uh, important personality of the physician, strong arguments, not jumping from one argument to another, keep the line, what you are doing, what you are saying, what you are diagnosing and what kind of therapy you are. And be open to, to call another colleague for a second opinion or third opinion, whatever. And that will, then the patient will benefit and will trustful in the uh, in the university hospital or elsewhere and of course in the leading physician yes yes absolutely and i'll also jump in to say that through the lymphoma coalition we do 
uh, a global patient survey around the world every two years directly to the patients. And um, in the last global patient survey, we had over 500 cutaneous lymphoma patients and caregivers. So we were able to pull that data out and it's data specifically from the patient experience, which adds that part in a data format into the mix. And we'll be um, launching the 2022 survey early next year. And hopefully we can engage all the physicians to share that with their patients to get more responses. And the more responses from around the world, we'll be able to slice and dice the data by geography, by the different diseases. Um, and we're adding an additional five specific questions for cutaneous lymphoma patients, um, asking more about, you know, the impact of on their uh, to what Guy had mentioned, you know, the physicality of the disease and how does that impact their quality of life and um, some questions around, um, you know, sleep and diving a little bit deep, deeper. And then from there, we can do more <laughs> and add back into the Proclippy. Um, you know, so the Proclippy, Professor Sadler, do you want to talk, can you share a little bit about what Proclippy is? Because I know no one on the uh, okay. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a coalition of uh, the International Society of Cutaneous Lymphoma with the uh, European uh, Cutaneous Lymphoma Group, and uh, which was founded together with the leading uh, female persons, uh, Jung Yang Kim and uh, uh, Julia Skarisbrick, and uh, the opening uh, meeting we had in Stanford years ago. And uh, then we divided uh, uh, the part of uh, early uh, disease development and uh, how many patients uh, will advance per year uh, to advanced stage of disease. This gave us uh, uh, the first uh, real uh, life data that we can judge about five, six percent of the patient will, will go into an, uh, another stage of the disease. And uh, the, uh, our US colleagues are focusing on advanced uh, disease. Then we ask the question, how many delay is associated with uh, cutaneous T-cell lymphoma diagnosis? But uh, as uh, Bouguie uh, say, uh, mentioned, uh, I think we made major advances, at least in the last years, uh, uh, in diagnosing uh, cutaneous T cell lymphoma. We advanced the field in blood uh, uh, criteria and involvement, especially uh, from the Leiden group, Martin Vermeer and Van Dongen. Uh, we have now a network, uh, uh, Euro Blood Network, uh, and we will uh, 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 start a, a study with new antibody cocktails just to objectively diagnose sensory syndrome not depending on any subjective notion of any physician. So I think this will advance the field. And, uh, and together with your, your foundation, we have to make a map. Where are the centers for orphan disease? Where are the experts? And then on the countryside, we also have to uh, uh, identify physicians who are interested in these uh, disease. If you, if you don't have any physician who are interested in the disease, forget it. So this has to be compassion. And this is a key issue. Yes, a lot of work to do. I'll we'll be circling back to you for all of that so we can update our, our European center listing. Yeah. We just finished updating the US list. So on the website, so we'll, I'll get your help for that. Yeah. Um, we had, I know Guy had to jump off, so we want to just thank him for his time and yeah. efforts, and um, he's been such a wonderful um, proponent for cutaneous lymphoma patients in France. It's, it, he's, it's been delightful to work with him. I know we're, we're finished a time. We did have one very clinical question. If you have, a few, if you have another moment, Professor Stadler, yeah, um, it sounds like a... Uh, a patient that um, is trying to determine, it sounds like a Cesare patient and did okay for the first cycles of treatment. The counts went, the Cesare counts went down, um, but they're trying to 
figure out, I guess, with their physicians, when do you, when are the counts low enough that you modify, I, like I, you were I, talking I about, that, right? The maintenance? Got, yes, you, you got the question quite right. And this, uh, I was shown the total number of T cell counts. And this mm -hmm. is not the criteria. We are far uh, further in the development. So we have special criteria. These are CD4 positive, CD26 negative T cells, or CD4, CD7 negative T cells. These are the major characteristics. And this has to be followed. And these are the parameters to classify B1, B0, B1, B2. And then you do fax analysis. And this has to be done, let's say, uh, every other eight, eight uh, weeks or 12 weeks. And then you see the, the decline if the patient had B2, as in cellular syndrome, he had to, for by definition, then you can control objectively the, the part of CD4, CD26 negative T cells. But you have to have a fax analysis to have this objective parameter. And then you can, this is an important question, then you can extend the cycles uh, of Mogamolizumab and see what is the individual dose to keep this patient free of disease or clear mostly. Right, so it's the combination, some very important things I think that you raise. It's important for patients to be seen, uh, especially with more complicated uh, subtypes to be seen yeah. with experts in the field. So you need to be at an expert center and they need to have the right tools for making sure they can actually understand what's happening in the biology in addition to seeing what's happening physically on the skin and then having those conversations with the patient and an expert physician with the data to determine how the treatment should be done going forward and then to be monitored very closely because we just don't have that many patients and we've got these new therapies. So we're learning as well and it really needs to be individualized. So thank you. I, I think it's so critical for patients to um, find their way to the expert centers, even if it's just for a one-time second opinion. Yeah. And, you know, I, and, and I know everyone that I know on the clinical side is so willing and wonderful to work with other community physicians and so forth and serve as consults because not every, all patients can physically travel all the time to That's the true. major centers. So you are all fabulously um, generous and willing and able to collaborate with other clinicians. So I think that's really important. Um, let's see, I think, and I know we're already 15 minutes beyond and Gee, you're back. <laughs> oh, okay, we have one more question. Diagnosed with MF 30 years ago, still doing fine, good. Taher, um, using diprostine for skin lesion and wondering about the best treatment. Well. I always think it's good to talk to your physician, and I'm not familiar with that topical. Um, is, it might be a steroid. What was the name? I didn't get uh, it. Diproxene, D I P R O S E N E. Diproxene. That means it's a steroid. Sounds like a steroid, right? That's, yeah. that, that's a steroid. Okay, you know, uh, steroids, you can use it to, uh, 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 which uh, is anti inflammatory but it's not specific for uh, cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. And if you take it too long, you harm your skin. Uh, you have a tremendous atrophy, teleactasia, whatever side effect in steroids uh, yeah. induce. So I think nowadays we have far better uh, uh, skin-directed therapies uh, than to use high-potent uh, steroids over a longer time. Yeah, yeah. So it would be great to um, talk with your physician. And if your physician would be, if they're not a cutaneous lymphoma expert, and they may not be aware of some of the, the newer availability of like Ladaga and some of the other treatments, then I'm sure um, Professor Stadler or any of the other physicians, depending upon where you are in, in Europe, um, would be happy to consult, you know, and share and make sure that you know, your physician is aware. So, yeah. 
think that's I think that's it. So much to take in, you know, it's like everybody's head explodes. I know it's hard. I, I've been um, doing the deep dive with with all the wonderful scientists and researchers for 11 years, and it's still a lot to kind of wrap your head around. But I think that's why we're all here from the patient organization side is to kind of do that translation and and put that together in layman's terms. And um, and again, it's so wonderful to be welcomed and invited into the clinical community with such open arms because that really makes a difference you know, and bringing that information forward to the patients. So thank you so much, Professor Stadler and Guy. Always thank a pleasure. You. And thank we'll all. gather in Marseille for more dialogue. Hopefully, yes, maybe, we'll maybe see. We can, uh, we can find a way to get Mickey to come, yeah. Mickey and Tan. <laughs> <laughs>